We're moving on to film now and how to activate these solutions that we've been talking about and really uh, how to drive that change in the masses. And a huge pleasure to uh, introduce Greg Reitman. He's a producer, director, and uh, the, the big dog behind Blue Water Entertainment. So big, big, uh, big pleasure to introduce him and uh, looking forward to the panel. Thank you. I think the howling started, Sally and Chip. Didn't it start with Ted and Pat Mitchell in 2007? I think that was my first R day. And we were howling. We're still howling. This is good. Um, thank you, Chip Cummins. Thank you, Sally Rainey. This is my fifth R day out of 15 years. And every year it just gets better and better. I don't know how you guys do it, but thank God you do it. Um, it is with great pleasure that we're doing this panel today. Um, it's called Blue Plastic and Ocean Rescue, and I have the honor to introduce Deanna. Deanna. Deanna Cohen, um, who runs the Plastic Pol um, Pollution Coalition, and uh, Hannah Testa, who's from Atlanta, um, who runs Hannah for Change. Um, so we're going to start. Um, my first question I always like to ask um, individuals is what inspired you to do what you do? Um, we know that plastic is a, is a ubiquitous issue. It's something that we're all going to have to deal with now and moving forward. And uh, I'm really interested to understand, you know, what motivated you, Hannah, particularly, because you're so young and vivacious, um, to what was your call? Okay, so I talked a bit about it in my last panel on Monday. Um, around, uh, I was in kindergarten, and I really loved organic gardening, and I wanted to share that with my classmates. Um, so on Earth Day, I grew tomato plants in my laundry room for two months to give to each of my classmates so they can start their own organic garden. And I did a presentation on Earth Day and how to recycle and how to be green. And I did those presentations from kindergarten to fifth grade. And I always had this love and passion for animals. And when I got older and was more aware of so many issues affecting the animals I loved, I wanted to do something. Because a lot of these endangered animals were becoming endangered because of human-caused issues like poaching or destroying of habitat. And so I got involved with other organizations and helped out with their campaigns, whether it's attending fundraisers or helping collect petitions or working with their campaigns and becoming like board members. And I realized that I can also start my own campaigns and petitions and fundraisers. And that's when I created Hannah for Change. Uh, so I can. How old were you? I was 10 when I started Hannah for Change. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really want to bring this out because I was thinking about it. I was like, wow, I was, like, I was looking at your age. I was like, this is incredible. Thank you. I mean, 10 years old. Did you have any doubt of what you were doing, or was it just you were just going to do it? Um, a bit of both. I mean, I knew that this was my passion, and this was kind of like my calling, and that I had to use my voice to help those animals that didn't have a voice of their own, or at least couldn't communicate with us about their struggles. And that's why I did what I did. And I didn't really know many people really anyone that was doing what I was doing. But I had the amazing support of my parents. My dad's here. Say hi, dad. <laughs> <laughs> and I, had, I met so many great mentors along the way, like Miss Deanna. <laughs> um, and it's really been a great journey. And what was the impetus to get behind the plastic? So I, through the work I did with animal species, I became a little bit aware about plastic pollution because it has such a huge effect on so many marine animals and on seabirds. Um, but I didn't really realize how big an issue plastic pollution is until I watched a documentary called Plastic Paradise. Um, and I don't know if any of you guys have seen it, but I'd definitely check that out. There's so many amazing documentaries. Um, but Plastic Paradise is really what opened my eyes to the issue of plastic pollution and showed me our addiction to plastics and how every was, individual... Was sorry. there like a striking image, though, that you saw in that particular film she, that, really took, that really took root to you? Yeah, the producer, Miss Angela Sun, she traveled to Midway Island, okay. which is um, right near Hawaii, right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in the Pacific Gyre, where it accumulates a lot of plastics and other trash. Um, and they would cut open albatross birds, these little chicks that were just a few weeks old, and they died because their stomachs are filled with these plastic pieces that we would use in our everyday lives, like bottle caps and cigarette lighters. Well, not me, but, you know, <laughs> and straws and things like that. And it broke my heart to see these little baby chicks and just dying from these, these plastics. How do we get, how do we, 
Do you have a URL or an Instagram? How do we connect yeah. with you? So um, the organization, Hannah for Change, that's HannahForChange.org, and then on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, it's the same thing, Hannah for Change. But the fours, right? It's yeah, Hannah. the number four, it's yeah, the okay. digit. I saw that, right? And was yes. there a reason why you chose the number? Uh, we felt like it was more creative. I was 10 at the time, and that's just what I came up with. <laughs> that's fantastic. And, and Deanna, what was your inspiration behind what you do? Well, my background is as a visual artist, and I've been making work for almost 30 years out of plastic bags that I cut up and sew back together and show in galleries and foundations and museums. And when I started working with those materials, my background was in painting. Um, I was, it was really a celebration of plastic as a material, the colors. I was really fascinated by the colors. And that some of the bags were transparent or opaque, translucent. I could use them like oil paints or like watercolors, combine them. And then I realized we were also printing all of this information on bags. So. Uh, messaging, words, text, a lot of natural images from the natural world, animals, plants, flowers. And really, I remember in my lifetime, plastic bags being introduced at the supermarket. And they were introduced because you were going to save a tree by using a plastic bag. That's re really how they were offered to us. Would you like paper or plastic? And the idea was by using plastic, you were saving trees. But in effect, at the time, in a sense, maybe you were saving trees. But I think what's happened, I'm just going to bring it full circle. Go for it. Is that we've been designing all of these single-use packaging for most of our food and beverages and, uh, and things that we sell and things that we market and this kind of convenience that's been sold to us without realizing that it's Frankenstein. I mean, it's, it's literally, it's a, when we use plastic, particularly when it's, being used for a short time period. We are taking a valuable material, primarily made from oil and fossil fuel byproducts, and we are using it in a highly irresponsible way. So through working with my artwork, some of the pieces had some of the bags in them started to break apart. And I got really excited, and I thought that it meant that the plastic was ephemeral and organic, like <laughs> us. And I thought, oh, this is awesome. It's breaking down. It's going back to the earth. I love gardening. I love. I grew up on the Pacific Ocean in California, Southern California, an eternally aspiring longboarder. I'm a diver. You know, but I just kept seeing more and more plastic in the ocean and grabbing it and things. So I wanted to go out and clean up the Great Pacific Garbage mm -hmm. Patch as, as an art piece. Mm -hmm. And I developed a proposal to do it in 2008. And then the more people I spoke to who were actually out in the ocean looking at it, like Captain Charles Moore mm -hmm. from Algolita, and Enrique Sala from Nat Geo, and David Rothschild, Sylvia Earle, the more people I talked to, the more I realized, wait a second, we have to back up. We need to look at the big picture. The big picture is we are using this material in a totally non-sustainable way. We need a full system shift. I like that everyone's talking mm -hmm. about system shift, mm -hmm. and that that's part of the title. Yeah for this event, and we really need that, and we needed it yesterday. So in order to bring that about, um, uh, anyway, I co-founded Plastic Pollution Coalition. And what year did you found that? We co-founded it, we had our soft launch um, in the end of 2009. It was hosted by Leonardo DiCaprio's mom at her place, and she said, I'm really angry, I walk the dogs twice a day, and I pick up plastic garbage on the beach in Malibu, and it's really pissing me off. And, you know, well, I th again, I think cleanup is wonderful and it's part of the solution. I think that we really need to focus our energy on front, I call them front end solutions, so source reduction. How do we bring about source reduction? And do we bring it about through policy and legislation, through engaging with companies and corporations and extended producer responsibility? And we need to move and shift and change the narrative away from this concept that we need to just give a hoot and not pollute because that is something I think that has been fed to us and that shifted the onus onto citizens and the public. And we need corporations and companies and anyone who is affiliated or on the board of any companies who is in this room, I, I implore you to take a look internally at what you're doing and how you even serve lunch or eat lunch at your, at your business, at your office, but also to look at how your entire uh, 
model works from production or extraction if you're using resources through end of life and waste management and see if there are not real ways right now that you could select or choose alternatives or reusables. Um, well, I think it's really interesting because it's like, you know, I remember, I don't think it was Jay Nichols who had the came up with the concept like out of sight, out of mind, mm -hmm. you know, therefore we don't see it, therefore it's not a problem. And, you know, and it's so ubiquitous now, it's everywhere. So um, what, do you, what do you, both of you, what do you see is, is, our, is the challenge? What do, you, what do you find as you're, because you're on the day-to-day -day front, you know, trying to connect with people about this particular issue. Um, what do you feel are, the, are your challenges? One of the challenges that I get, I'm in Atlanta, and we're not exactly by the coast. We're a few hours away. Um, so a lot of people don't have that connection to the ocean. And so they really don't see the impact that plastic pollution has um, directly as much, um, except for maybe just in like their neighborhood. So they don't feel that if they made changes in their daily lives that it will still have an impact on our oceans. And it does because of our rivers and our streams and our lakes, they all end up into our oceans and people don't make that connection. So even if you live 20 hours away from the nearest beach, you're still, your trash might still end up in our ocean. So you still have to make that shift. So what do you life. say when people, like how do you, you know, what's your dialogue typical when you, you know, when you're trying to bring change? Um, definitely educating them on the issue of plastic pollution because plastics, every single piece of plastic made um, is still somewhere on our planet because plastics live for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's going to live out, live, us, live out longer than you, than all of you, than me, um, your children, your grandchildren. It's going to be on our planet for such a long time. So that one straw that you use uh, because of convenience is, can harm so many marine species along the way, can end up in your sushi, and can end up in you. Yeah, which is interesting. I want to, we'll talk about that. Can we show your video now? Oh, yes. We want to show a really cool video. Open your eyes. When did we become a plastic society? We got plastic bags, plastic water bottles, plastic straws, plastic cups, plastic wrap, plastic utensils, and plastic to-go containers. Plastic is a substance the Earth cannot digest. And every bit of plastic that has ever been created still exists. Every day in the United States, we throw out almost 88,000 tons of plastic. Now, what happens to plastic after you use it? Well, most of it goes into landfills. A portion gets into the water course and eventually ends up in the oceans. Recycling is not a sustainable solution. It's actually called downcycling because plastic never goes away. Consumption of disposable plastics has spiraled out of control. What is the number one thing plastic is made out of? Well, every year we use 17 million barrels of oil to make plastic water bottles. This is enough to fuel one million cars every year. Plastic pieces on the ocean surface now outnumber sea life six to one. Plastic makes up almost 90% of all trash floating on the ocean surface. 46,000 pieces of plastic per square mile. What effect does plastic have on human health? Plastic chemicals like BPA are absorbed by the body. Studies show that they alter hormones and disrupt the endocrine system. By refusing disposable plastic, you can improve the health of the ocean and the environment around us, including human health and animal health. Since 2009, Plastic Pollution Coalition has been building a global alliance to combat single-use disposable plastic. Our membership includes individuals, organizations, NGOs, businesses, campuses, and policymakers. We share resources, tools, and messaging with our coalition to develop a broad-based strategy to tackle the issue head on. We're working with universities, businesses, festivals, musicians, and more to create replicable and sustainable approaches to eliminating single-use disposable plastic. Plastic pollution is a global problem that humans alone have caused. We can do something about it. 
please join our coalition. For more information, visit www.plasticpollutioncoalition.org. Remember, bring reusable items with you, like a water bottle, a cup, a bag, utensils. Refuse plastic when it's offered. And remember to say, no straw, please. Only purchase items in sustainable packaging, like glass and wax paper. Thank you, Deanna. So I wanted to share, we had a, um, there's a woman named Robin Tyner um, who couldn't make it. She was supposed to be on our panel today, and she is dealing with a death. Um, but we asked, when we met her yesterday, um, she's been on this path for a long time as an oceanographer, and we, I asked her to just to share a couple of words, which I'm going to read now. Um, she said, over a 30-year Navy career, I was blessed to work across the Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, and Arctic Oceans, and many beaches. The topic is very personal to me as an oceanographer and witness, as a stage three cancer survivor who tries to watch everything that goes into my body, and a mother concerned about how much more my kids are already ingesting. I'm grateful for people like these and other fantastic PAL members who are leading the charge in tackling this problem. Anyway, she's a really sweet person. I just wanted to share that. She's with us now, not here physically, but in spirit. Um, the second thing I wanted to chat with, um, I had the opportunity to meet Deanna at the UN on an incredible panel with Dr. Gregory Stone, Fabian Custone. And one of the things that you really brought front and center was the health issue. And I always believe it's, it's when it's personal, it's not until we actually become sick or we have cancer or people actually wake up. It's kind of a sad thing that happens. Um, in our design and human nature. We'd hope that we can expand our consciousness that we don't have to suffer, but maybe you can just bring a little enlightenment in terms of what is in this PVC that we really need to be aware of. Well, it's not just PVC, but so just, I'm not a scientist. I'm just gonna preface everything by saying I'm a visual artist. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I originally was a biology major in college, so I understand a little bit. <laughs> um, a lot. <laughs> it turns out that that, Depending on what, we, so what we use to make plastic, whether it's a petroleum-based plastic or we use a plant-based carbon source to make the plastic, we add chemicals. I say we, the royal we. When you make plastic, and I wish Scott Seidel was here. I don't think he's here yet. No. Because he can talk to this. We make plastic by adding phthalates and bisphenols. They are groups of chemicals that are plasticizers, and they give plastics the qualities that we associate with this is plastic. For example, make it transparent, translucent, supple, malleable, rigid, the different qualities that we associate with plastic come from these chemicals. And you may have heard, oh, this is BPA-free, as if that is preferable to something that's made with BPB or BPC or BPD or BPZ or BPS. But it turns out, if you talk to Dr. Califat, who's the head of the endocrine disruption department at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, that the replacements for bisphenol A are equally bad, if not worse. So just let's just pause it. So like two days ago, I was drinking a cup of water up at the Viceroy, and it's corn base, and I'm thinking that I'm drinking this water and it's okay, and you're telling me that it's not now. I'm not sure. I don't know what the corn-based uh, plastic is made with. But you're saying the actual, with. the actual... Well, there may be additives that were added to the corn, which is the carbon source. So Interesting. We leave it at that for a moment okay. and just say that the chemicals, these phthalates and bisphenols, phthalates have now been identified as obesogens, meaning that they've been linked to causing obesity. And bisphenols, particularly bisphenol A, which has been studied the most, has been linked to lower sexual function, sterility and infertility, breast cancer, brain cancer, and prostate cancer, as well as um, obesity and diabetes. So it's also in a study that they did with rats been linked to liver lesions, which is liver cancer. I'm just gonna say on a totally personal note, it's funny for me that somehow working with plastic as my primary material for my artwork for almost 30 years has brought me full circle to working on plastic pollution as an issue and looking at how to stop it and measurably reduce it. Because when I was a teenager, preteen, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. And when I was 17, she died of breast cancer that was estrogen receptive. So these chemicals feed our body in a way they function like synthetic estrogen. And they cause our body to, to hold on to fat, 
and to uh, bioaccumulate these things. And so if for me, it's really like this incredible, I'm 53, so my life's kind of come full circle to something that I studied science, I studied art, I had this deep, personal, impactful experience with my family, and it's brought me full circle to feeling like I actually can get up every morning and work on something that is gonna help reduce that for other people around the world. And Plastic Pollution is a coalition is a global coalition, so we're over 700 groups now working so, on so, different so, aspects so of this issue. So, you, I mean, why isn't what you're, what you're explaining, I, I, in my mind, I would say this is a national or global epidemic. What is it that we're, why aren't we connecting to the health, the health issues of this particular um, element? That's really easy to answer. We're exposed to so many pollutants and environmental pollutants that it's difficult to prove that this one is causing mm -hmm. the problem. And that is why I am only empowered to say they have been linked to. Oh, I see. So we're not able to actually distinctly say that this particular element creates cancer. And well, so therefore... we can from a study that was done with rats. Now, there okay. are people in the world that say that exposure to low levels of bisphenol A causes liver lesions. You make your own determination. I, like I said, we started out as a biology major. Any of these things are enough information for me to make me try very hard and I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but to try very hard at home for myself and my family and the kids in our family to reduce the amount of food and beverages that I'm buying packaged in plastic. And so, can I add to that? Yeah, go for it. Well, from actual experience, I know the American Chemical Council, which is this huge plastic industry, they don't like the idea of bringing more education about plastic pollution. So with What do you mean they don't like the idea? They have a lot of money, as you can imagine, so they definitely use that to their advantage. Um, which I've seen personally with the work that I've done. And so I know um, that they also pay like scientists to not release their reports and also probably to quiet more people. I know there's people in the Georgia government that are actually paid um, by the American Chemical Council to make sure things that like I'm doing won't get through government. Interesting. So we have a lot of pushback yes. coming back. No, I understand. So let's just take another, let's, let's move the conversation. So, you know, in the last, we just talked about like Facebook and social media. I've seen more infomercials of plastic and turtles. What is, what is rising? Why is this particular issue now becoming front and center on our social media channels? Should I go? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I think that we really hit a tipping point, and uh, I would say we're cresting a wave right now, particularly in Great Britain and Ireland. Yeah which is, and really that is, thank, it is thanks to a number of documentary films, so the power of film and art as a communication form, very important. Um, but in particular to uh, Sir David Attenborough, mm -hmm. uh, narrated a series that's called Blue Planet 2, yeah. and they showed it on television in Great Britain, and people were deeply mm -hmm. affected by it. And it addresses the impact of plastic pollution in the ocean and how it is impacting um, sea life as well and potentially coming back to us if we depend on seafood or sea life for our primary protein source. Uh, and so that kind of created a tipping point, it, it did create a tipping point in Great Britain, and suddenly the Queen Mum of England came out with a statement that she's getting rid of all plastic mm -hmm. straws and single-use plastic for all of the royal households and for their events. Mick Jagger tweeted about it. I mean, that's really cool. <laughs> Mick Jagger was like, no more single-use plastic. And, and what is it that I was reading about McDonald's? What's yes. how, are you? Yeah, so are McDonald's you... just made a commitment. Well, we had a petition. So what we're able to do as a global coalition is to support the work of different coalition members. So one coalition member will come up, or, or a group of them will come up with an idea for a petition. They'll be doing it with Move On or with a different organization, and we will help share that. We've, we're, we're involved with a petition. Um, encouraging Starbucks to make some changes that they need to make. Do you get pushback from Starbucks? We do get pushback, but I think, I also like to look at this issue, and I don't know if you guys look at this in general as we work towards a restorative climate for the planet. Um, I don't like to look at this as a battle or as a war, and I don't like to use this kind of patriarchal hero narrative that we've seen used for so long. I like to say that companies and corporations can see the writing on the wall. This is coming, this is holistic, this is systems change. Um, this is, I'm sorry, all the men in the room, I'm sure you're sensitive, but this is female and feminine, 
And this is coming from a desire to create a sustainable planet, mm -hmm. not just about saving human beings mm -hmm. okay. as a species. Yeah, and to but, go back, oh, sorry, yeah, to go, go back on. to Starbucks, actually, I worked with the coalition not too long ago. They had a shareholders meeting in Seattle, and their paper cups are lined with plastic. So it makes it impossible to recycle. And many people don't know that. Interesting. Exactly. And so um, we were able to get over a million petitions. And they um, committed to using $10 million to designing a new cup so that it doesn't end up in the landfill. So maybe can you talk a little bit? And this is amazing. Can you talk a little bit? Like, as you're on the front lines, and when I think of Starbucks, um, like. What does that look like? Is that just an immediate, like, how many no's do you have to get to to a place where actually, I mean, can, maybe you can just yeah. give a little bit of what's really happening on the front lines and, like, how does that change and what does that look like? Well, to reach um, different corporations, it really just depends. Um, like, with a lot of places recently, I know with um, Alaska Airlines, a little girl sent them a letter and they committed to no longer using plastic straws. And same with um, a 16. restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. So social <laughs> yeah. media, the video, it, it touched their yeah. hearts. They woke up, someone saw it in marketing, and then there was an impetus to bring change. It yeah, it really just depends on the people that see it. Can I add to that, yeah. actually? I think that young people have so much power to create this change. I mean, I agree with that. Maybe, maybe actually like 90% of the power because I love when I hear people like Hannah speak, or Lily, who got up earlier, yeah. uh, or Shelby O'Neill, who Hannah was just mentioning, who worked with Alaska Airlines. Mm -hmm. When you hear them speak, it, they are 100% of the future. We are not. And, and so to take it back, so when, you, when, when like an organization like Alaska Airlines and they make that change, how do you capture that? Like how, do we, how are you disseminating that, that information out for them when they make that change? And does it go back to Deanna's organization? Or what does that look like? Yeah, I think it definitely, we find it fairly easily. Okay. Um, and then we definitely spread it out even more so more people become aware of the issue. And even if you're, let's say you're on the flight and you're like, hey, you don't have any plastic straws anymore. And just talking to like the air, air stewardesses about the issue of why they're not using plastic straws anymore. Interesting. And do you find that this is like an everyday conversation that you have now, Hannah? Um, as part, yeah. as part of your path, right? <laughs> yeah, for the most part. I'm, I just finished high school, but it's not so much during school um, as much because I do go to public high school. I just finished my freshman year. Um, but I do, it's very common, and I do have a lot of events and phone calls I do so after school. In the high school, are you dealing with the cafeteria and then talking with them about on that, on that straw issue too? Yes, right? I am planning to work on it with uh, my principals and because we have the styrofoam so trays. So you actually are going right yeah. to your principal. And what do you say to that? What do you, um, how do you begin that dialogue? Well, I'll ask them to a meeting, and I usually bring a ton of like pictures and statistics about plastic pollution to kind of get his attention and to really get him emotionally too. Okay. So to get the emotional connection with these pictures of animals that have been suffering with like the turtle with the straw up its nose and the whale in Thailand that recently died and um, talking about the impact of plastic pollution and how much school lunch, like how much plastic is just in school lunches every day. It's everywhere. There's crazy it's statistics in your Ziploc bags, it's your containers, it's the utensils, the trays, it's everything. So what do you think, Deanna, what, Deanna, what do you think, what's it going to take for us to get over the hump? Well, I think that we need to keep continue on the path that we're on, and that's really a path of love and engagement and working towards shifting the, shifting the narrative and systems change. Um, but it's also going to take legislation and policy mm -hmm. and extended producer responsibility and corporate engagement. Well, it's interesting you talk it, about and, legislation. And, I mean, you're dealing with, like, the Chemical Association. There's the petroleum industry. I mean, these mm -hmm. are very large, powerful organizations. I yeah. mean, um, they throw a lot of money behind things. Mm -hmm. I mean, they spent probably $3 million at one point and then another $5 million trying to overturn the California bag ban. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. But, you know, after seven years, they failed. Mm -hmm. So we banned them. And, I mean, for me, plastic bags are just... That's the, great, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> they're, just, they're just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the tip of the iceberg. You can't compete in a conflict model like that with organizations that, that their annual revenue is $455 billion a year or more. Yeah. You can't compete with that, but we have power in numbers, and we have power with wonderful youth ambassadors who talk to this and are passionate about it, and we've worked with a lot of different coalition members. So, for example, in the last year, we worked with Made Safe, Amy Ziff, 
and we created a healthy baby guide. And it's free, and you can download it from our website. Oh, that's great. It's really a plastic-free baby guide. We also worked with um, Post Landfill Action Network and created a campus plastic reduction guide for colleges, but it's applicable to high schools or junior high schools or elementary schools as well. And you can just download it for free, use those case studies and models, and then go and put the right group of people together at your school or at your place of business and begin a conversation to have engagement. Because it, we're headed this way right now. It doesn't matter, even if you're like, up, oh, bah, humbug, no. So do you feel like the queen was really the answer to the call for this? Like that really sort of pushed us now where? I think in Great Britain, yes, she was. I mean, because she was so outspoken about that, a number of different companies like Waitrose or um, the noodle shop, Wagamama, all of these companies have made commitments to phase out single-use plastic straws by the end of the year to switch to either paper straws or no longer offering straws, only having them upon request, but getting away from plastic. It's just a beginning. I know it seems like a little thing, but these little things can have a ripple effect because they help you become more aware and open your eyes, and then you look around and you see the to-go utensils, you mm -hmm. see the to-go packaging, et cetera. Can you share a little bit? I, sure. I remember when it was, can you, you have the, the straw? Oh, sure, yeah. I brought some yeah, straws let's, with me let's too. Let's just um, share a little bit of this. I am in love with, um, <laughs> I love iced tea. And who um, doesn't? I can't, who doesn't? <laughs> and um, I carry reusable stainless steel straws in my yeah. purse with me, and I try to carry more than one just in case I'm out with a friend. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's very nice for me. Yeah. And how does one get them? Let's just talk oh, about um, the, the you can basics. Find them, you can find them through our website or you can find them online. Okay. Our website's plasticpollutioncoalition.org. There's also a wonderful site called Life Without Plastic. Mm -hmm. um, you can find them. A lot of different people have them. And so I encourage people who really like straws to use these. But what I found is whether I have a reusable straw with me or not, there are glass straws. There are straws that are actually grown from straw. Mm -hmm that you can use. Mm -hmm. There are paper straws. The most important thing you need to do is say, when you order a drink, say no straw, please. And, and, and just give us a, a perspective of how many straws are going in the ocean? What's, what's the statistics? Do we know how many are actually finding their way in the ocean like every day? Is it like I'm not sure how many go in the ocean every day, but over one billion straws are used worldwide every day. One billion and that's every day. Probably, it's probably, it's probably, it's probably higher, higher, higher than that. Okay. And that does not include like the juice boxes with their straws. And half of that, 50%, is just from the U.S. alone. So that's 500 million the Straws. U.S. uses. Yeah, non every day. Wow. And that can fill 127 school buses of plastic straws from just the U.S. alone. And then I'm sure other people have mentioned this in some of the other panels, but based on the Ellen MacArthur Circular Economy Report that came out about a year and a half ago, they released it at the World Economic World Forum at Davos, they predict that at the rate of plastic production we're at right now, that by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish by weight. They're actually moving that number up and saying mm -hmm. it's gonna happen sooner. Mm -hmm. So if you're not freaked out or concerned about it yet, I hope that you will begin to pay attention to well, it. Well, I think also, I mean, in truth, you know, as it becomes more of a health issue, we will become more concerned. And I think yeah. as, 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 as the lining is in, in our fish and we love our mm -hmm. fish, you know, as we find out that our fish are now, be, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to become sick by eating that fish. It's going to, it's going to even grow even further. What, what's your big takeaway? What can, what can we share or depart? Like, if, if every person was going to say something to someone, what would you want them to say about this particular yeah, issue? Yeah, I actually have a few things. Tell me. That's okay. Okay. Well, um, I usually talk about five main things you can do. One is, well, they're all like doing things in your daily life, so it's not that hard. Um, the first thing is taking reusable bags to the store. Um, and a lot of places you do get some money back. I think Target does that, Whole Foods does that. Um, so for every reusable bag you bring back, it's probably around five cents um, that you get back instead of using plastic or paper bags. And the second thing is straws, which we touched on. Um, using reusable straws that you can find online um, or at Deanna's website. Um, <laughs> And also, you can reach out to restaurants. It's even as easy as when you're sitting at the table um, and ask the, to see the manager and talk about plastic straws, or thank them for not automatically giving up, giving out a plastic straw. Um, the Do we have thing, a sign, by the way. Uh, That's another thing. Like, you've you created this great toolkit. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's like a restaurant where they have like the sign. Where yeah, there is. There is. So there's a project called the Last Plastic Straw. They're, okay. they're they were yes. part of the coalition, but now they're a project of ours. Okay. And it was founded by Jackie Nunez. And she's created a whole toolkit that you can find on our site, on her, on the page for the last plastic straw, 
where you can download these wonderful little um, business cards mm -hmm. that you can leave with establishments that just in introduce them to this idea and encourage them to change their protocol and stop automatically putting straws, serving drinks with straws mm -hmm. in them, That's and amazing. have them only available upon request, and then consider moving away from plastic and bioplastic yeah. straws. All right, and we're coming back to you, so that's, yes, you're so, in the third, go yes, on. The third you have restaurants, thing, was three. Um, the third thing is bring your own bottle. I see a few of them out here today. Yes. That saves plastic water bottles, and there's recent studies that we were talking about just yesterday. They find um, so many microfibers, uh, which are types of plastics that are in our clothing, they're finding it in almost all plastic water bottles, all the major brands. So plastic is in your own drinking water, and that should never happen. Um, so um, I take my reusable bottle everywhere, as you can see. And you save money. Yeah, you save money along the way, I think. So that's the fourth, and what's the yeah, fifth? Yeah, uh, that was third, I think. Okay. Fourth is, um, shoot, okay. <laughs> One, two, three. Well, um, So the water bottle amazing. is the fourth, right? Utensils. utensils, there we go, Thank utensils. Uh, showed a bit in the video, but you can get a whole pack of reusable utensils made of bamboo, and they're amazing. I have so many of them that we use all the time, and I definitely recommend using those instead, instead of literally putting the plastic in your mouth. Um, and the fifth thing is just getting involved and bringing more awareness to the issue, whether it is going to your restaurants, whether it is telling your friends or family, um, whether it is buying things um, to give to your friends and family, um, like bottles or straws that you can use. Um, just simple things um, just to bring more education and awareness about the issue of plastic pollution. Yeah, and so the last thing I want to talk about, which is probably the, very troubling, is maybe, Deanna, you can talk a little bit about the microfibers and how it's mm -hmm. getting into the water supply. Right. And what does this actually mean? And, and Let's and, scare everybody right at the end. Well, I just want to, I want to bring it front and center to the point that everyone, it becomes a personal issue. Because if it's not personal, no one's going to care and no one's going to change. Mm -hmm. So the reality is when you turn on the water now, what do we need to be concerned about? And obviously we can filter our water. There are ways that we can, you know, that we can drink our water. But maybe you can just shed a little bit of light about that. Okay. So the Orb Media produced these two incredible citizen science reports that came out in the last year. One was that they're, they're finding microfibers in drinking water from around the world, including the water at the White House. And uh, they also then released a report looking at top 25 brands of bottled water and found that those also all have microfibers in them. Microfibers are washing out from our clothing. Yeah. Many places in the world, it's a wonderful idea. Now companies are looking at and creating filters that we can put on our washers and on our mm -hmm. dryers, but they have to filter down to a certain micron level, and many of them do not. So I think we really, again, need to look at a systems change. And that systems change, and I realized this. I was in college in the early 80s at UCLA. I realized I started, I, I bought the advertising. I started buying Evian bottle of water and walking around with it. Like, and I feel like such a chump. I was buying plastic bottle water for my family and thinking, well, good, they're not drinking, I don't know, Coca-Cola. Um, but now I realize I really feel like a chump because it was at that moment in the early 80s when I stopped paying attention to my municipal water source where I lived in Los Angeles. And that is a dangerous position for any of us to be in. Look at what's happened in Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Look at what's happening in other areas around the United States and other parts of the world where they don't have access to clean drinking water. It's very important for us to wake up and become aware and look at these systems and look at not only how we maybe filter water that's coming into our apartment or our home or if we're traveling, traveling water, but also look at how do we fix this at a community level where we live, which is gonna, it, it's gonna necessitate a much larger holistic. financial investment, but it's important for us to look at that. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a holistic change. Hannah, what do you have anything else to say before, before we open this up well, for questions? I know a lot of you are probably gonna get on flights either tonight or tomorrow <laughs> or upcoming, and a lot of flights use those plastic cups and those stirs. So either bring your reusable bottle like I have or okay. ask for the can. That's what I do. They have like sparkling water that I take. Ask for the can and they'll give you the can and say, I don't want the cup, please. And you can just use that instead. And that's just something simple that you United can filled up my Yeah, cup you can ask when I fill the cups. Amazing. And you can do the same with a lot of um, like restaurants. Like if you go to Starbucks and you use your reusable cup, they'll give you five cents off your purchase for using your own 
the cup. Well, first of all, I'm just totally moved by both of you. It's <laughs> cool. just phenomenal. I love the great. idea of this toolkit, how you're making it accessible and how it's downloadable and that there's an action that anyone can take and how it can be spread out. So well, we're also working on, and we're going to launch it in July for Plastic Free July, okay. a plastic reduction, a global legislative plastic reduction toolkit. I know that's a mouthful. <laughs> And Say that one more time, a global, a global legislative plastic reduction toolkit. And what does that look like? It will be uh, housed on our site. It will be a place that you can go if you're working with uh, politicians or representatives, if you are an organization. It, we will have different entry points, and you can go there to find information. To if you'd like to, them. to empower people or help facilitate starting a bag ban, starting a polystyrene ban, working to phase out plastic to go, you know, materials for foods, et cetera. So plastic straws, but we're launching it with the plastic bags. We'll be first, and then we'll be adding different Amazing. sections. This woman over here, she's. <laughs> I just have something to share. Okay. okay. What's your name, and what do you want to share? Oh, wait, there's a microphone. I'm trained with the mic. <laughs> So I just wanted to share really quickly one day, I thought, you know, people were exaggerating about this. Mm -hmm. And so in 1981, there was a thing called Cambridge Diet. Do you guys, anybody remember Cambridge Diet? Mm -hmm. They were the first people that came up with cups like this. Mm -hmm. And I actually bought one and I just started using it all the time. And I multiplied it again. And I drink three cups of tea every day. And so I started in 1981. So that was uh, 12,305 days wow. times yeah. three. So I have saved personally 36,915 cups. Wow. So, See? You know, Amazing. Yeah, and so one of the things with the airlines, you know, they, you know I, I carry my own, mm -hmm. I drive everybody crazy. All my <laughs> friends call me a hippie. Mm -hmm. And uh, which I'm okay with that. <laughs> and um, and so and my Chinese friends call me a rich hippie, which is a very nice compliment for them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the things that I do with the airlines when I carry this, then they always want to pour the water. They don't want to pour it in here. Mm -hmm. So then I kind of chase them around until the water is about this high. And then I say, can I please have the bottle now? And they go, you're so committed. <laughs> and it's like, it, it, it's just a little tiny inconvenience. But I feel like really good about that. And I still, mm -hmm. you know, plastic bags is still are happening. But it was interesting because in China, it was about 10 years ago that they make plastic bags, you know, just they, you hardly find them anywhere. So everyone carries their bags mm -hmm. there. Like we did way back in the days in Chile when I grew up and in Europe where we all carry our own bags. Amazing. And you just feel so good. You know, just mm -hmm. it's like I do a wonderful things on the planet, but it makes me feel so happy mm -hmm. that I have saved 36,000 yeah. cups. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. I want to encourage everyone to do it. The woman over there, right over there. I think the mic's coming to you. We got about a minute and a half. Cool. Hi. Um, I used to work in hospitality, and anyone who has can tell you that nobody there likes when a whole bunch of customers aren't happy. So I say, this plastic cup, we all take it up to the desk and tell them to stop with this because it's actually not very green. If you look it up, it's just a marketing ploy. Mm -hmm. So we should all maybe do that. Just Great. Woo. Good idea. Do it with love. Do it with love. And right here, Joni. Do it with love. Love and intention. Right? Yes. And if you guys don't get the opportunity to ask questions, we're yeah. going to be around. We're here. Hi. Well, I'm excited about this. And uh, one of our R Day members that is not here is Lynn Cherry. Who, and I'm on her board, Young Voices for the Planet. And we're doing a new film on kids wow. doing the straw thing. So I just wanted you to know about it and everybody to know about it. And she's also part of our World Dignity Forum that the Poem mm -hmm. Foundation's doing that you're all invited to. Because mm -hmm. this is an issue, and we'll put it on our platform when we do it in India. And we have CNN as our partner with 250 million people looking at it Great. as well as streaming so right. thank you Joan. we want to offer that to this campaign and thank one you. more Me right too. over thank here you. last question and then we have to conclude before barkley thank you it, thanks very much it's actually a two-parter if you would try to speak briefly about the state of the biodegradable plastic pluses and minuses and i think we successfully got one of our local businesses to stop using styrofoam every time we walk in there oh, we would say we don't want to eat our food on styrofoam can you do it can you and over time, and he said, I want to be green, 
but the bamboo costs 50 cents and the styrofoam costs five cents. And I'm like, you know, as a consumer, I'm willing to help you offset that cost. You know, I'm willing to take the hit. So as all of us, as we go out, let that be known to our local businesses that we understand that we don't get to have it for free, that there is going to be a price to the cons end consumer. Can I answer you really package. quickly? Okay. Go for it. So if you're interested in gaining a deeper understanding of bioplastics, I often ask a man who's in the room named Scott Seidel about them. <laughs> Scott! Yeah. Um, we wanted to have you here. But, <laughs> but we just produced with seven other coalition members a Better Alternatives Now 2.0 list. It is on our website. You can download it for free. And it does try to help uh, explain what's going on with plastics and bioplastics and the difference compostable with studies that were done, citizen science studies, and also compare the European system to the US system. So I think you could find information that would be helpful there. And additionally, most people don't know this, but the lids on to-go cups are generally made from compressed polystyrene. OK. So as you can see, this is a huge topic, a lot more to discuss. We can talk about it for weeks. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. And I can see Barkley giving me the whip, so we're going to conclude. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.